this is the second episode of the podcast, and the first one was with Shan Lugby, this one's with her over here, and I'll let him introduce himself. Yeah, um, we're coming in a little bit choppy on my end, I'm not sure what that's about, um, but I'll introduce myself. I uh, make YouTube videos, uh, primarily it seems about Marilyn Manson and fascism, but also many other topics. Uh, I like to keep it a little bit eclectic, and I like to talk about things that stimulate me intellectually and challenge me and make me think. And uh, I, I do, I think I have a kind of a central message in what I do that I try to push in my content. Uh, as much as possible, uh, and so that also drives me forward. But uh, I'm very happy to be, uh, at this point, uh, reaching out and talking to more people. I had a conversation with a YouTuber named Cleary uh, a week or two ago that was really nice, and so uh, I'm happy to be doing more podcast stuff like that. Yeah, that, that's where I had the idea for this one, was whenever you did the one with him. Yeah. Um, what would you like to talk about? Well, I said you had a message, so I want to know what that message is. I guess, for me, uh, I'm really interested in trying to heal the discourse, and so... I see that people have a really hard time communicating with each other and uh, expressing different ideas to each other without getting really angry at each other. And I think this is bad for our culture. And so one of the things I want to do is get people okay with disagreeing with each other and get people to be to kind of learn how to have conversations again, because I think we've, we've been kind of reared into this mentality of conversations being combative. And that's why I don't like the whole debate format, um, because it, it encourages competition rather than uh, actual, you know, coming to a mutual understanding on something um, and coming to an agreement on something, which I think is, is vital for having a, a society that can actually work through its problems. And so that I see as the, the, great, the great problem of our age. And I think it's, it's interesting that other people, I think other people are noticing something like that. Like I hear people talk about uh, divisiveness and, and polarization, uh, and yet they don't really seem to have any idea about how to address that. But to me, I think the answer is staring us straight in the face. And all we need to do is just uh, let our guard down a bit. I don't disagree. Um, did you see that Alex Friedman thing with Ben Shapiro and Destiny? I did see that it happened. Uh, I'm surprised that the two of them haven't had a conversation yet because they're the two most fast-talking uh, debate bros on the online sphere, uh, and it seems like that would be a a, a well matched uh, conversation. But I do think Lex Friedman is a great example of what I'm talking about. He's he's one of the best at discourse because he doesn't have his guard up, and because he uh, is more interested in in having a conversation than in having a uh, a, a competition and so but i don't really think uh, either destiny or ben strike me as that kind of person so i didn't i didn't actually see the conversation how did it go honestly it went quite well um very respectful they agreed on quite a bit they disagreed and lex only had to intervene once oh well that's great um yeah i think that out of out of the uh, left-wing streamers, Destiny is probably the best at discourse and debate. Um, I haven't 
seen Ben doing very much uh, discourse. I mostly just see his his solo uh, monologues. But uh, that that's great that they the two of them were able to uh, have a proper conversation. I really like seeing things like that. I think I think I think people tend to pick up on that kind of vibe and resonate with it when they can see that that people are letting their guard down and just uh, allowing the conversation to progress in a civilized way i think people people can admire that and so i think it's it's a position of strength that uh that sort of technique and so i i, I can see it catching on in the future i can see people getting tired of the combat combativeness but uh it's gonna happen slowly obviously because i think i think we just have a very angry culture in general and it's gonna take a long time to heal that yeah that makes sense so where does marilyn manson and fascism factor into this well i think with with both of them they are uh creatures of controversy and so they arouse a lot of emotion and so the great challenge that they put to us is to approach them without getting roused up and uh, listening to what they have to say and taking in whatever uh, messages that uh, we can draw from them that that might actually be uh, useful or helpful in some way. Um, but they're also just very stimulating because they, beca I think because they're so hard to understand and yet there's, there's so much kind of power and mystique therein that they kind of draw me into wanting to understand them more. And that's kind of a, an infectious combination for me so with, with manson it's really i mean he's one of the most brilliant artists if not the most brilliant artist i've ever seen and his ability to uh use the most cryptic forms of messaging to deliver uh what he has to say and to not even brag about it is quite impressive to me and just just the amount of, of thought that he has inspired in me is quite impressive to me as an artistic achievement. And with with fascism, um, I think that really, I mean, the challenge comes from trying to trying to scrape away all of the layers of trauma that have kind of scabbed over the topic and made it difficult to understand because there's a great collective trauma around that subject and it, it still hurts people's feelings to this day and it influences the way we engage with it but uh and, and it makes it difficult to engage with it objectively and so so that has also been a great challenge because so much of the literature and, and the opinion that you see on that topic um it is kind of programmed from the perspective of being against it. And so we're not really allowed to just engage with it as it is. We always have to caveat, caveat the discussion with a, a huge heaping mound of um, sort of dis disapproval. But I, I think most most uh, ideologies don't get that sort of treatment. And so all I want to do is treat fascism like any other ideology. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, even communism is more acceptable than fascism and objectively it killed more people. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I'm not I'm never too comfortable determining you know, which ideology killed more than another ideology because there's there's just way too many factors that go into that. But certainly I think you can say, you can definitely make an argument that communism has on the whole been more dangerous than fascism. And yet communism still has 
uh, a, a, a very strong uh, contingent of the intellectual sphere in, in which it is still politically correct uh, to to just acknowledge its bright spots and uh, even if if you don't even if you don't totally get behind it to at, at least engage with it honestly um, and in fact it's kind of frowned upon in the intellectual sphere to not engage with it on that level and, and, and to engage with it on that very kind of paranoid Cold War level and yet we have a very paranoid Cold War approach to talking about fascism and to me I I think that's kind of a hypocrisy although I'm not I'm not really one to get mad at hypocrisy in general I kind of like hypocrisy but it is an inconsistency that I don't think is necessary and I don't think is productive I definitely would agree but because you know speaking publicly you know that's the whole argument is well, fascism kills people well communism kills people too you know everything kills people but you have to see there are benefits to everything. Yeah, I mean, yeah. otherwise, really otherwise true. it wouldn't have gotten popular. And so I think in order, I mean, even if you don't like fascism at all, you better at least know why you don't like it. <coughs> you better at least know why other people do like it. Um, and that, that requires actually being able to engage with it uh, on the level of, of, of thinking of it the way a supporter would think of it, thinking of it sympathetically, as I like to say. Thinking of it admirably. <laughs> yeah, and being willing to admit when you find yourself admiring it, as I have, and uh, certainly, um, you know, not everyone is going to have that perspective on the subject, but I, I found that I was personally kind of taken in by a lot of its messaging, although a lot of its messaging I wasn't taken in by, but uh, at least I'm able to admit that and to have the honesty uh, to say that, um, but without without feeling the need to constantly pussyfoot around the issue, like, like don't worry, guys, I, I'm not an actual fascist, don't worry, don't worry, but like, constantly trying to reassure people I, I i don't really like that that mentality uh to discourse i would rather just say yeah i admire fascism it's kind of not maryland but charles manson-ish <laughs> explain you know. that well you know people are like you know if you say you admire fascism people are going to call you a fascist so it's kind of like you know if they're going to call you a fascist, they've made up your mind that you are a fascist, so you might as well be a fascist to them. You know, you kind of reflect what they put on to you. Yeah, that's interesting. Charles Manson is a fascinating person. I I, uh, I did a, a little period of study on him for uh, the last Manson video, the last Marilyn Manson video that I made. Uh, I didn't get to do a thorough uh, study of the guy. But I found that uh, there was there was so much to him that was thought provoking, and I really appreciated the way he thought about things, even if it, it ultimately I think comes from a far too liberated intellect. I I, I think perhaps he was so. Uh, unrestrained in life just because he, he, he never had rules in life and he, he, he spent his entire life as a criminal, um, a mentally ill criminal at that, that it gave him a, a unique perspective that was a valuable perspective, but it, it, it also, uh, I think, was a perspective that uh, is ultimately not very conducive to like being a good person have you read the manson file by nicholas shrek no i haven't you should it's full of his ramblings and musings yeah uh... there's a really there's a really interesting one about humanity and how like the only thing that can save humanity from itself is something greater than earth 
Well, that's interesting because, uh, you know, that makes me think of that movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. Have you seen that film? I just rewatched that the other day and it got me down this whole rabbit hole. Yeah, because the thing that really resonates with me about that film is that uh, we see how the the HAL 9000 is sort of like humanity trying to evolve itself, but it's humanity using the tools, only the tools that it gained from the last contact with the monolith to evolve itself. So it, it's essentially kind of a, a, a humanity incestuously evolving itself, inbreeding itself into a higher plane of existence with this, this uh, artificial intelligence that's supposed to be far more capable than a human being uh, and it ends up just falling victim to the same vic- the same vices that the monkeys at the beginning fell victim to uh, and so the only way to really advance beyond that stage was to reach out to something higher than mankind and that was that was uh, the the Jupiter mission, I guess, with the 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 second contact with the monolith. Yeah, it's really interesting how the AI turned out in that movie. You know, it's kind of like you live with apes and you act like them. Yeah, you live with apes, man. It's hard to be clean. Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> well, I think that 2001 expresses itself in Manson's lyrics, like, you know, this is evolution, the monkey, the man, then the gun. I think there's a lot of 2001 in Marilyn Manson. It, it's a very Nietzschean film. Yeah, explain that to me. Well, it, it kind of, you know what the eternal uh, return is? The way I understand it, it's the idea that uh, mankind in his best form would want to live his life as it is over and over again, because that is the most life-affirming way to be. Yeah, it's the idea that your life will repeat over and over and over again. It's... um. There's actually some evidence to suggest this is possible, kind of. Um, hmm. he, there, there's this guy named Brian Cox, who's a, I think he's an astrophysicist. He was on Joe Rogan once. But he, um, he kind of just rewrote the Big Bang recently in a way that kind of leaves the possibility open. That's interesting. I... I, I've heard that the the Big Bang theory has been undergoing a revision lately. Although I know nothing about physics, so I, I I would not be able to understand the math behind that. Yeah, no, I don't know anything about physics either. But um, there's this one guy who characterizes it pretty well. It's um, the Big Bang was not the beginning. There was something before the Big Bang, and that something is what we will have after the Big Bang in our future. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of string theory from those fucking Nova documentaries. That was, that fucking blew my mind, but (laughs) I wouldn't know the first thing about explaining that. But yeah, this idea that, uh, the Big Bang is not the uh, the the ultimate origin of the universe. That there, but you know, when you get down down to that level, like what is time? Is you're you're kind of you lose me at that point. Like time isn't linear, and I mean, I I don't even know how to understand that. Yeah, once you get down to the time aspect of it you lose me yeah no and that's kind of where that scene in space odyssey where you know everything dilates kind of comes in Mm. 
yeah, going beyond the bounds of space and time. So anyway, off that topic, which yes. is sure to give someone an existential crisis. Um, I was scrolling through your Reddit. You're gonna make. You said you were writing a script for something based on Antichrist Superstar. Yeah, I've been attempting to brainstorm the uh, the, the the way an Antichrist Superstar stage play could work like a musical stage play that incorporates all of the songs uh, from the album and i do have a lot of ideas about how that could be done um it would i think it would have to be kind of paralleling the story of manson because really antichrist superstar is about manson and it would also have to be uh Sort of like how in Hollywood, where he he makes this mythological parody of of Hollywood and Death Valley as Hollywood and the Valley of Death, uh, and everything's a little bit different than it is in our world, but uh, only to exaggerate the uh, things that he wanted to uh, satirize or criticize about our world. And so I had this idea that. Uh, like it could take place in a, a mythological version of the United States where the president is literally considered the the incarnation of Jesus Christ on earth and that um, when the the Antichrist kind, uh, takes the throne of God he's he's uh, taking the throne of the president and so because the president literally is god and so there's a lot of ideas that i have uh for what that could look like but it's an interesting idea i just haven't quite figured out how it'll all work together with all the songs because there's so many songs that it would have to it would have to be long and even then uh there wouldn't be a whole lot of downtime between the songs so it's kind of like that VMA performance with beautiful people. Yeah. Where he was like running for president. Yeah. My fellow Americans. <laughs> well, and and he has he has that flag, the American flag with the shock symbol. And I had the idea that the that that the uh, American flag could originally have just a white cross in the canton and then he replaces it with the shock symbol yeah that would be very interesting and the shock symbol is kind of is reminiscent of the um british union of fascists yeah it is uh, i was watching this documentary the other day um, about another artist named uh, Boyd Rice, who was who actually a lot of interesting intersections with Manson, but it it made that connection between the two. I forget exactly what it was, but game game was in it. So, what'd you say there? Um, what what was the last thing you heard? Uh, that there were connections between the two? Oh, yeah. There's a whole bunch of connections between the two. Um, but, yeah, there, there's a very interesting connection between that symbol and Manson. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it, it, it's a symbol of power, and I think it, there's the connection there between... Uh, the way Manson used it and the way the BUF used it, I think it's meant to really strike people. It's meant to really uh, make kind of electrify people. It, it's the part of fascism that attracts people. It's aesthetic. Yes, the aesthetic, the aesthetic of fascism is extremely important. Um, 
And it, I thought it was interesting the way Manson used it because the way I interpreted all of the fascist imagery in his Antichrist Superstar performances was I interpreted that as in trying to dismantle what he calls the fascism of beauty and the fascism of Christianity. He ends up kind of just adopting his own fascism of, of anti-establishment uh, philosophy. And that gets to the whole idea of him shedding his skin to feed the fake, like these, these sort of ideals that he once held as the worm, as you know, him wanting to be like the beautiful people. Uh, he was now getting rid of them. He was now, uh, you know, freeing himself from those trappings. But at the same time, he was feeding those very same beliefs, uh, just an anti-establishment version, an inversion of those beliefs to his followers who were eating them up as the new breed of worm, which thinks that it's become enlightened and thinks that it is now... Uh, becoming an individual and growing its wings when really it's just it's just doing the same thing it was doing before eating dead skin but it just happens to be uh, it just happens to be edgy dead skin it, it's kind of like how the two polar extremes are exactly the same when you get down to it well yeah and how the Christ and the Antichrist work with each other in the same divine plan how the Antichrist exists to sort of cull the herd and make way for the new Jerusalem. And it, it's funny that the, the Antichrist is so uh, I, I hated or feared. And I guess, I guess it's hated or feared by, by weak people who believe that they're susceptible to the influence of that kind of deception. But really, I mean, it's it's part of God's plan if you read Revelation. Yeah, it's. Have you ever heard of the Process Church of the Final Judgment? No, I haven't. They're men they're mentioned in the Long Hard Road Out of Hell once, um, but they're kind of this really interesting thing where it's kind of like, no, 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 we need to combine Christ and Satan. They're, it's all the same. They took every extreme and kind of combined it into one. That's they interesting. Would go, they would go out and get fascists and communists and anarchists. And try and, it was this weird Scientology split off. It was absolutely weird. But it kind of made sense at the same time. Is it... Uh... Are 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 they just kind of believers in duality then? Kind of. Hmm. Kind of. They were really weird. Yeah. Well, yeah, and and I think the duality message is really uh, one of the things at the core of Antichrist Superstar, and I don't know if I fully. I, you know, it was it was very valuable looking into those uh, television interviews of Marilyn Manson from the time because I, I you he drops little clues in those interviews of of what he's saying, and then those helped me greatly with trying to interpret the lyrics. And one of those little clues was um, he was talking about uh, in in the MTV Canadian Much Music panel he said uh but our record is balanced i think because it looks at both sides and up until that point i hadn't thought of this record as a balanced statement and i thought what could he mean by that it looks at both sides it's balanced and then from there that unlocked so much it made it make way more sense how contradictory everything was and I think that's part of what made me really appreciate contradiction 
and the unity of contradiction and hypocrisy. I think I, I, I began to really appreciate that from, from looking at the album in that way because I could see how everything in that album is expressing a duality. Everything in that album is expressing both itself and its opposite. And so it feels very wise in that way, even though it's, it's uh, you know, it has songs like Irresponsible Hate Anthem that make uh, an outside observer think, well, what what is this? Just some, uh, you know, uh, fanatical hate album but then you look at the title and you think well that's self-aware he's saying it's irresponsible hate and so there there is a, an awareness of the the trappings of of its own um sort of identity which i think it really elevates that album in a way that the vast vast majority of people don't seem to even know about I mean even if they're not consciously aware of it, I think Worm Boy kind of encompasses it the most blatantly. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that that song is is all about doubt, isn't it? M most definitely. I mean, it's like when you get to heaven, you'll, get, you'll wish you're in hell. That sort of thing. But people can go watch your video on that. Yeah. I had to sit through three hours they can too <laughs> well it's actually four hours it's three hours and 52 minutes oh i'm sorry three hours and 52 minutes yes i i hope i never have to make something that long again but yeah i'm supposed to be working on i'm supposed to be working on a video about uh mechanical animals right now but man i'm just kind of just kind of dreading getting back into that because it's such a, a challenge. It's such an undertaking trying to interpret a Marilyn Manson album. And I already have a pretty good idea of what that album is about. But, uh, man, it's like I'm afraid of getting back into a project like that uh, because I know it'll eventually be very stimulating and engaging. But, man, so much of the early process of... of both both Antichrist Superstar and Portrait of an American Family for me was so pained and labored because I, I was just like, ah, I'm not getting anywhere. Um, I suppose the one I'm really worried about is Hollywood because that album just kind of baffles me. Uh, I just, I, I understand the, some of the motifs in Hollywood, but for fuck's sake, I cannot figure out the lyrics and how they come together. Yeah, Hollywood is a whole monstrosity that I've spent the last year trying to understand. It's just, just as you think you get it, you find something new that completely destroys it. Yeah, and it, it, it's so, I think that there's there's so much, it's so opinionated. That, that one feels like, uh, maybe aside from Portrait, his most opinionated album and uh i think that one is is a little bit more about about his opinions on on outside external things than than on his personal experience and that might make it challenging because i don't want to misrepresent his opinion yeah because it goes into like you know it's obviously the column mind shit but then it goes into like JFK, John Lennon, and Jesus Christ. That that's a whole monstrosity in itself. Yeah, and you know, I, I can kind I can kind of see what he's getting at there, but I just don't I don't entirely get it because uh like I, like, what's the overall message? Because he's obviously making a connection between fame and people who are seeking fame and people who feel like losers in their life and violence. Um, but but what exact conclusion he's trying to pull out of that is a little bit difficult for me to comprehend. 
I, I think there's quite a few different ones. Like, you know, there's the if you die when there's no one watching, you know, dying on TV. I think hints to that we're on Antichrist Superstar two. Because mm. in Mister Superstar, Mister Superstar is like, would you kill yourself in TV? You know. Right. I I didn't think of that connection. And then you know the JFK connections go to holy, not holy, but fuck. Um, go to mechanical animals on post human. I think it is where it's like that's the first time Kennedy is mentioned. Yeah the 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 way that uh, mechanical animals led into Hollywood is fascinating, especially because the Columbine thing didn't happen until after mechanical animals, and so uh, it's fascinating to me to see how he was already thinking about John F. Kennedy, not only in Posthuman, but also in the music video for Coma White. And then Columbine happens, and then that ignites that thread of thought he had already going even more and makes him it really uh, turn it into something even bigger. But it's really a shame because there was supposed to be a book that he wrote for Hollywood, only one chapter was released. Yeah, and it was it was like chapter ten or something. It's like, what the fuck am I reading? And, and and it never came out. And I'm starting to wonder if he ever even wrote the thing. Yeah, then there was supposed to be a movie for it too. Oh yeah, and it was supposed to be directed by uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky, which would have been pretty epic. Yeah, you know, so many failed projects. <laughs> Oh yeah. Same thing with the Phantasmagoria movie. Yeah, that that one. <laughs> I don't know uh, how that one would have worked out, but that that that's interesting because it ties into his whole eat me, drink me phase. Which, even though I said I said in uh, one of my videos that that Golden Age of the Grotesque is the last album of his that really felt like uh, a performance art piece uh, that was really uh had had its own identity uh, but even still there's there's still traces of that with eat me drink me in the connections he makes between i guess it's he's making connections between his relationship with evan rachel wood dating someone way way younger than him a, a teenager at the time uh and then the the lolita connection with like uh, heart-shaped glasses. And then, you know, if you look into Lewis Carroll, you find out that he had an inappropriate relationship with uh, Alice, uh, who he based his book on. And so it's fascinating to me to see what he was trying to get at there with, with creating an overall, uh, and, and an overall statement, uh, although I, I haven't studied the album at, at all. And, and to be honest, it's not an album that I particularly like, so I don't listen to it very much at all either uh but there is something there that that is a little bit bigger than this is just a collection of songs and Fa phantasmagoria seems like it was it was uh feeding into that yeah it can see it can seem like that but then the stills from phantasmagoria were just the weirdest thing i've seen <laughs> that and that's considering it's manson yeah, I don't know if I've ever looked at the stills. You, you can find it on Kushner's site. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder what what that movie would have been about. I mean, I know it was about Lewis Carroll, but uh, I wonder what his idea for that movie was. Yeah, he's he talked about it in so many interviews, but never give like a coherent answer hmm. and he's always good at that one of the things that is really admirable about manson is that he doesn't feel the need to over explain his art like i think i would be the kind of person to want people to understand my art and so i would explain stuff in great detail but he has a lovely way of just dropping little hints without getting too explicit about, oh, this lyric means that, and this symbol means this. Um, and there's this double meaning, and he always, he's always littering him, his work with double meanings. 
And so it creates a big project for me to, because I guess my my goal with all of this is to make this art accessible for people in a way that it never has been before. So if you don't want to go through all the effort that I'm going through, you don't have to, and you can still appreciate the full uh, scope of of what he's actually doing with his art. Yeah, he, he I'd say it's not even double layered. I'd say it's triple layered, sometimes more, especially with the letter fifteen. Hmm. That that letter is so ingrained in his work. And I was like, don't even know where it began. It's just always been there. Yeah, I'm not really much of a numerology guy and and the occult numerology stuff was kind of one area where I struggled in my analysis and so I'm not quite sure what the 15 thing is about but uh, it is interesting well there were 15 15 victims at Columbine if you include the shooters so there's that that's that's interesting that's that's an interesting little uh coincidence of fate he must have taken that in as a sign was it a coincidence and maybe he really was behind the shooting yeah he he orchestrated it well then then he also orchestrated it the weird uh sort of i guess uh, a red herring that they were actually trying to blow up the school and and kill most of the people from the explosions but those didn't work uh <laughs> I, I don't know how that would have factored into his plans if he only wanted 15 people dead well you see he, he would have intentionally let everyone else out first then you know the reflecting god mm. Yeah, the reflecting God. That well, that whole thing with the how the, the you know the end of the world is really just a suicide, but then it, uh, it can also be interpreted as a collective suicide, as the suicide of American values, and, and that's just that's just how Manson's stuff works. Like it, it leads you on these these trains of thought where you can interpret. A lyric or an idea in so many different ways but it's not it's not that only one of those ways is correct it's that they all kind of all those meanings interlock with each other and add something else to the piece it's it's very abraxas Does i that can't make sense? I, I can't remember what that is um abraxas was this is this gnostic kind of hermaphroditic collection of opposites mashed together. I think most people nowadays know of like the symbol of Baphomet as that. Abraxas predates it by so, so much. No. Balance. Balance, that's the word. Yeah, I think there's a lot in Gnosticism that kind of holds the key to understanding uh, a lot a lot about um, just uh, symbology and and uh, the occult and um, also just just Abrahamic religions. But uh, it, it's a subject that I've to, to this point not devoted uh, really any study into, but I think it's one that, I should at some point study because I just keep hearing things about it here and there. And every time I hear something about Gnosticism, I think, well, wow, that's amazing. But then I forget about it. And so I don't really know what Gnosticism is even about in the end, but uh, it just seems like one of, one of the kind of the hubs on this, this, these uh, wheel that I'm interested in. Well, then it brings back to Charles Manson because he called Abraxas his god. Well, that makes sense. 
it's so interconnected. Yeah, what's the deal with the swastika tattoo on Charles Manson? I think it's supposed to represent power, nature, order, you know. Mm. Yeah, because I looked into it and it seemed like he had a different understanding of what the swastika meant than what most people would assume when they look at it. And that that kind of did seem to um, really, uh, I guess, uh, harmonize with a, a lot of what I know about Manson, that, that he, he likes to... Uh, deceive people into thinking that uh he's overrated i guess <laughs> he likes to deceive people into th thinking that uh there there's really not much to him at the bottom of it that he's just a crazy uh even though he has all these pretensions and people read all of these amazing things into him but i i think uh that that is a deception and when when you really look into it you see oh oh actually this guy this guy is kind of as interesting as people believe he is or as his followers believed he was yeah i, mean, I definitely would have loved to have a conversation with him but he's dead now so yeah i i don't know if i i don't know if i would have been able to have a conversation with him but I, I guess you don't have the conversation with Manson. He has the conversation with you. He he controls it. Well, I mean, I guess with AI now, we could have a conversation with them. Uh, yeah, that would be terrible. Like, have you seen the AI George Carlin routine? I, I have, and it was just... I, it, it wasn't good. Yeah, it it wasn't quite right, was it? It it felt off. It felt like someone who didn't know all too much about Carlin tried to do something. Yeah, it just felt like. Well, I heard that they it got just felt sued. Repetitive. I heard that the creator yeah, got they... sued by uh, the George Carlin estate. Yeah, his his daughter filed a lawsuit, so. And that's interesting because that could determine a lot about the future of this sort of thing, about uh, the right to someone's image being uh, manipulated by just just not not even uh, big companies, but just just regular private creators. I don't I don't know if I really care which way the lawsuit ends up because i don't i don't know if i really care too much about whether we're able to make ai george carlin routines well yeah i don't really care either but i do think that it's interesting how it can take on the personality of someone who's dead like a friend of mine um made a book and he got um ai to write a synopsis of it as if Anton LaVey wrote it. It was really interesting. Huh. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, I mean, LaVey uh, has a very particular way of writing. Uh, it would be interesting to see how that would end up. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send you the, I'll say the thing for it. It's it's a really it's it's very similar. It's very bombastic. It's you know, they had a very bombastic way of speaking. Yeah, I do I do rather like LaVey. I wish that there were more interviews of him on YouTube because I really liked uh just seeing him talk in real time to people. Yeah, sadly during the eighties he um Something happened where someone did like hours upon hours of interviews with them and completely trashed them. And they've never seen the light of day. So there's hours of interviews with him that are just gone. 
and after that he kind of lost trust for recorded interviews so yeah that's a shame because i i think that uh he was a really one of a kind important voice in the 20th century uh for uh for you know people questioning religion and and um questioning the uh the sort of social conditioning of society and wanting to stake out a place as individuals yeah it's well they definitely hit big i mean i don't think we can even measure certain influences I don't even think we can measure the influence of Hitler yet because it's still reverberating. Yeah. I think a little bit. For those listening, that's not to call Levay Hitler. <laughs> I did have this argument with this dumb fuck yesterday. <laughs> you, you had an argument about what? Oh, just, you know... They were like trying to convince me that Levey was some sort of Nazi. I don't know. It's weird. I mean, I guess the whole idea of survival of the fittest is a thread of comparison between them. But the Nazis were all about conformity. And so that's a stark difference between them and Levey. Yeah. They always bring up his associations with people like James Mason, if you know who that is. I know the actor, James Mason. Oh, let's say she has an uncle. But I don't know uh, the one you're talking about. Uh, James Mason found, founded or helped found Adam Waffen Division and wrote a book called Siege. And LeVay gave him like a copy of the Satanic Bible that was signed. It was more out of like, you know, respect for going against the social norm and mainstream. <laughs> an actual agreement, but you know, people take that how they want. Yeah, I think I actually have heard of that guy, although I don't know anything about him. What 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 was the organization he founded about or what was the thing he founded about? Well he was initially part of the original like American Nazi party. And then he broke away and then did some other stuff. Got arrested for possession of Interesting content containing minors. And, yeah, then he found it out and often. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting the intersection between degeneracy and puritanism there. It reminds me of uh, that movie uh, American History X, where uh, uh, Edward, Edward Norton's character is the only actual neo Nazi in that town because everyone else is just doing it because they want to be racist and have a club where they can all be racist together. But Edward Norton actually believes in the values of the Nazis. And that kind of, that makes all the people in prison hate him. All the neo Nazis in prison hate him because they think he's a square because he's telling them not to do drugs and not to you know, rape men and stuff. And then they end up uh, punishing him very severely for that. That, that kind of reminds me of the um, the movie Believer. The Believer with uh, Ryan Gosling. I'm not familiar with that one. Not? Oh, he's this um, Jew who's trying to be a Nazi. And it's very... It, it ends with him trying to blow up a mosque. But instead, he tells everyone to get out. And he's the one who gets blown up. Huh. It's really interesting. A Jew who becomes a Nazi. I mean, that's that's not unheard of. Yeah. It, I don't know. It's just... It's an interesting movie. Yeah, I think I heard because... about that uh, when listening to, to a, a podcast by a, a couple of neo-Nazis. What were you going to say? No, uh, no, nothing really important. Hmm. Yeah, because I was, uh, I was, just I was spoil the movie. Oh, okay, because I was listening to uh, a podcast with this guy, uh, Cultured Thug, 
who was uh, a, a YouTuber who identifies as a classical fascist, but he used to be a neo-Nazi. And I was listening to him talking to this podcast called the Nordisk Radio, which I guess is a, a neo-Nazi podcast. And uh, that's one of the movies they brought up. It did kind of pique my interest, but uh, I, I wasn't uh, really sure if I understood what it was about. Yeah, it's the whole Jewish Nazi thing is a really interesting one. Yeah, I mean, but... the the whole relationship between the Jews and I guess what we could call the broader national socialist uh, movement. It, it, it's difficult to parse out at times because I think, um, I well, I th I think there's been they they the, I th I think that they one one way in which the those far right people might have a point is that uh, Jewish people have been quite successful in controlling the conversation around this and preventing us uh, from having access to these far-right uh, thinkers and their anti-Semitic ways of thinking. And I honestly kind of feel like that that makes it easier for them to kind of circle jerk about the Jews and how much they they dislike them um, but it also makes it harder for outsiders like me to really understand the dynamic that's going on because there's just not enough communication there but like one thing that I really don't want to do is go into conspiracy theory mode and uh, kind of blame everything on the Jews, but that seems to be what those uh, far-right people like to do. And yet the Jews seem to not make it easy for me not to do that sometimes with the ways they behave. And so it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a touchy subject, I think. And uh, I'm going to have to do a lot of research if I ever make a video about that subject, because uh, it's definitely one that I don't want to fuck up. Yeah, you've already got the why you admire fascism video, so might as well. Uh, yeah. Just uh, get the algorithm to you. Yeah, and the thing is, something that Cultured Thug brought up in that interview is that, you know, he was able to make videos about... Uh, promoting fascism and other stuff like that. But as soon as he talk, started talking about the Jews at all, then he was immediately shut down. And it's like, that seems to be the threshold that you just can't cross. And so when I do eventually have to, to uh, reckon with that threshold, I want to be uh, <laughs> very certain that I'm reckoning with it in the right way um, because it's just like like the fascism thing alone is is difficult but the Jewish question I think is there's there's way more hurt feelings about that subject uh, and yet and yet there seems to be there there seems to be so many ways in which you can see how the far right kind of has a point about them. And I don't want that to sound like uh, I think they're they're right to be anti-Semitic because I don't. And usually I don't caveat my speech like this when I talk. But when it comes to this subject, this is one of the few subjects that actually scares me to talk about. Yeah, it's it's a difficult topic just given how, how layered it is. Yeah. Oh, definitely, for sure. That's about an hour. It's about an hour? Yeah. Want to go for another hour? I can try. I can yeah. Try. 
can see if I we might can... have to do something. I have to do something real quick. Oh, okay. Not... Um, I'm just gonna go do it real quick. Okay. Um, All right. Five, five minutes. Five minute break because my voice is dying. I haven't had water this whole time. All right. All right. See you in a few minutes. A few moments later. Are you back? Um, yep. Yep. I'm back. Great. I'm gonna, the recording. Turning back on. Wonderful. So, uh, yeah, I, I was interested in your uh, reading list that I found uh, because it seemed like you had uh, a lot of literature from very different contradictory perspectives. And uh, I, I do like that sort of thing. Uh, uh, how do you uh, interpret that? What, is, what does that mean to you? I think it's kind of the same thing as your open conversation idea, you know, just taking all the different points of view, you know, just putting something out, you know, not, not taking it for granted. Yeah. Um, I, I think, if, I think if more people try to understand these things rather than argue about them, just have a discussion about them, it would be so much better. Yeah, I totally agree, and not not getting uh, personally like emotionally invested in this as as if all ideas we consider have to be true. We can't consider uh, a wrong idea. Um, I, I I think that we really need to kind of grow up a little bit as a culture and learn how to uh, engage intellectually with each other i saw on that reading list fascism viewed f from the right uh, which was a, a book that i read pretty recently and i thought that that perspective on the topic was so valuable to me for understanding it because it, it was a it was not uh, an explicitly fascist perspective it was not a uh like a, a pro-regime sympathizer perspective like I, i've gotten from someone like uh james strackey barnes but it was at the same time the total opposite of any kind of liberal or left-wing analysis of the topic and he was saying well let's take a balanced approach in looking at fascism criticizing it for its weak spots uh but but uh appreciating it for its strong points but the funny thing is for him the strong points were the extremely far right uh talking points and the extremely far right uh beliefs and, and techniques and that's that's a perspective that you never see and i thought it was so fascinating because it's it also elucidated i think a lot about fascist ideology that it made it made it more clear and understandable uh and it's it's like because he was coming from a similar but not entirely identical perspective he was then able to present the perspective of fascism in a much more accurate way than a and a much more uh digestible way than i've ever seen it done before whereas most people i, I feel seem seem to be kind of baffled by fascism yeah i, I read it a bit ago i think i need to reread it because it's kind of getting fuzzy at this point it's been like six months um right now i'm reading fascism in britain from thurlow I, I i do agree with your opinion on it yeah um, that the british the british list which, oh yes uh which, which reading list was this i have a few i was on uh one of your little magazines that you got i i, I clicked on your website on discord and I, I found that oh the uh neo the neo Gandhi site yeah yeah I, I wanted to to see a little bit of what you were interested in i, I found it uh interesting because I, I i i i am i never expect to find people uh who have have this sort of contradictory interest in both individualist and collectivist philosophies and so it's it's always cool to to see someone else who who has found that connection interesting yeah i, I like the balance i like the balance 
Yeah, me too. And I honestly, I think I'm on the whole an extremely moderate person. Um, but I think I think that that the strongest kind of moderate is the kind of moderate who's able to be moderate even in the face of extremism. And most uh, so-called moderates are not able to do that. Yeah. That reminds me, I do need to write, I got this, the scathing critique of moderates I wrote. Oh, yeah? What's, what's your critique? The, most of the time they don't do anything but whine about the left and the right. Hmm. Like they don't really have any, anything. any real answers. Yeah, they, they kind of just say the same thing. It's like, you're, you're just trying to get a moral superiority. Yeah, the so the sort of the, the what what could you call it the the masturbation over being moderate just becomes irritating. The uh, selective judge and good guy badge. Yeah, as Manson would say. Well. Uh... Yeah, I, fi I find the British fascism that you're reading about the the most interesting area of fascism because uh, from what I've seen, it's the most um, relatable to a moderate. It seems to be appealing much more to moderates. Like the goal was to appeal much more to moderates than any other version of fascism that I've discovered. And so I found that it had a lot of appeal to me reading about it um and and that that i think says a lot about how british how how british society is viewed both within and without uh its culture as a very moderate culture and a very politically mature culture um i've been reading uh nicholas mosley's book uh rules of the game and beyond the pale lately which is in a fascinating book about uh it's about his dad but it's also about him it's like a, a combination biography and autobiography and uh he, 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 i mean i gotta say i think i think uh oswald mosley is one of the most fascinating people i've ever read about if not the most fascinating I would put him on the level of maybe Napoleon Bonaparte. He's probably the only other person, a historical figure I've been as fascinated uh, about as Mosley. Did, did you see that Napoleon movie that just came out? I wanted to at first, even though I don't like Ridley Scott. Uh, but then I heard that the movie was a train wreck. And so I got discouraged and sad about it. Yeah, it was a train wreck. That's really sad, because I really want to see a proper treatment of Napoleon's life. I really want to see somebody do Napoleon the way it should be. And it should be long. It shouldn't be one movie. I think it should at least be a trilogy of three-hour movies or, or a series of at least ten episodes. Um, but, like, something... Or 12 episodes some something that's able to cover the the small details of how he got from thing to thing because i think a lot of times they skip over that and it creates the impression that oh napoleon is just this great man who did one thing and then he did another thing and there's no feeling or th of thread or connection between those things that creates good storytelling and makes you really care for this person or or, or or find this person interesting but i i think the interesting part of napoleon is how one thing led to the next and it, it does it it shatters the impression that this was all sort of meant to be or that we're taking this for granted as just some thing that happened in history uh if we're able to look at it that way and so far i don't think any any movie has really done that just because of the constraints of 
time, among other things. I saw this Reddit thing that was like, it would have been better as seven two hour seven two hour episodes. Yeah. Oh, totally. I, I can see Napoleon being told in seven two hour episodes. And and you know, they never cover the really early stuff about how he uh he first got into the army as a, a lieutenant and uh then he he got promoted to captain after a fiasco in Corsica where he created the Corsican National Guard and became a lieutenant colonel and then got on the bad side of the governor who used to be his hero in childhood and a friend of his dad. And then the governor exiled him and tried to get him court-martialed and he went to the war office in Paris and they promoted him to captain. I mean, that's such a fascinating story that never gets told, but I think it would, if, if, if somebody would actually adapt that part of the story, it would, it would give people a, be a much better idea of who this Napoleon is so that, because it can kind of just feel like, oh yeah, he's a great man in history who just came on the scene and did a bunch of cool stuff. But seeing seeing that develop, I think, is a crucial element of the story. Yeah, the movie didn't start at all in his early life. It was like, it started, it was already to some degree in charge. And then it just went right in. Then it went to his personal relationship with Josephine. I'm not sure whether the letters that they read were real or not. I'm not too versed in him. Were they really hot letters written by Napoleon to Josephine talking about like how she shouldn't bathe because he wants to just be encompassed by her essence or whatever the fuck? No, they didn't really go that deep. <laughs> Because that's the kind of thing that Napoleon wrote, because he was infatuated with her, and she wasn't, she didn't reciprocate those feelings. He was a bit of what we would call a simp. Oh, he was a total simp. For a woman seven years older than him, which is an interesting little uh, sort of, um, uh, what, what would you say, unconventional age gap. I think it adds a little bit of spice to the Napoleon story. Yeah. I don't know, they just made him out to be like some incel. Yeah, <laughs> I heard about that. I don't know what to think about that because I do, I do get, you know, I do get kind of, kind of slightly incelish vibes from Napoleon, but, um, I mean, obviously he wasn't an incel because he wasn't celibate. So I don't really know what that, that means. Yeah, they were trying to make him into an incel without him actually being an incel. So was, was he just weird. was he just like really bitter about women or something? No, they they made him like like a complete moron when it came to Josephine. Interesting. Well, I I can kind of get that because Josephine was such a libertine. And he was trying to get really serious with her and like have the, this, you know, proposing marriage to her. And, and she, she was kind of not really taking it seriously because she was from, she's from a more, a, a culture of, of kind of sexual openness and liberality and where sex is treated very uh, casually and so, and she didn't really have particularly strong feelings about Napoleon one way or the other. And so there was kind of a one-sidedness to their relationship at first. Yeah, I, I kind of got that vibe. Again, I don't, I don't know too much about Napoleon. It's, I'm very lacking in that knowledge, but I'll, I'll take your word. Yeah, I mean, definitely one of the most amazing people who ever existed just with with everything he accomplished and everything that he was about in the time that he lived in but um yeah it's unfortunate it's unfortunate that hollywood has has so far struggled to uh really turn that into anything interesting yeah i was kind of 
excited about it because it was like, you know, they did Oppenheimer so well. I loved that movie. Yeah, it, Oppenheimer was great. Actually, I have the book that it was based on right here next to me. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I didn't even quite understand it because it was all very fast paced and there was so much conversation and you had to keep track of every little conversation that was happening with the different timelines going at the same time it was it was a movie that didn't really hold your hand much yeah it, it kind of just went all in but it made it make sense <laughs> yeah uh and it's i guess it was cool to see a movie about World War Two, that was actually about an intellectual, because so many World War Two movies are about uh, soldiers, and uh, so they they portray one very specific dynamic, um, but there are definitely other ways to experience the war, and I liked that it showed from a more a more sensitive intellectual point of view uh what was going on uh on a different front of the war i guess yeah my only problem was a few fabricated scenes like you know the scene with the apple yeah yeah and historically he got caught he did yeah he he got caught and his his parents bribed the school not not to expel him. So instead, they sent him to a psychoanalyst who he ended up hating. Well, that's... Uh... Niels, Bohr. Niels Bohr was not there to save teacher. That's pretty crazy, because, uh, th I mean, that's quite a thing to get caught doing. Yeah. And then there were a few other scenes that were fabricated or at least stretched. <laughs> but other than that, it was a great movie. Yeah, I was really impressed by it. Um, I think it's, you know, I, I've, I have not had the greatest impression of Christopher Nolan just because I think the only films I've seen from him were his Batman movies, and I didn't particularly like those very much. Uh, but this has definitely uh, piqued my interest a little bit more about him and made me more interested in seeing what he has to offer in the future. Yeah, I kind of want him to continue doing historical movies, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'd like to just see more historical movies in general, because there's just so much material there that hasn't been uh, given a chance yet. And history is is way more exciting than a lot of people think. What would be like the ultimate history movie? Um, well, I like, I like uh, the kind of, the historical farce idea as it was done in the death of stalin i thought that movie was very good and they also they also kind of did that in the show i claudius where it portrays the events of the early roman empire in a kind of comedic way um and so i would like to see a movie about like a really convoluted clusterfuck that happened in history where you know everyone's putting stuff on the line putting themselves at stake and people are winning people are losing there's all kinds of drama there's all kinds of uh you know personal issues um but treated in a, a farcical way so that we can see you know ultimately this is hilarious uh I, it might feel really important to the people in it but looking back on it we can see that it was it was really funny in hindsight and so like one one idea i had was like uh the year 1066 where three kings were trying to gain control of 
uh, England and become the, the king of England. Two of them happened to be named Harold. You could get some comedy out of that. Um, there were also, there's also just a lot of Roman stories that I want to see. Roman stories that haven't been touched on. Um, like, uh, the year, the years of multiple emperors in Roman history. You have the year of the four emperors, the year of the five emperors, the year of the six emperors. I would like to see one of those get adapted into, into a, a farcical film. Um, just because I like, I like power grab stories where uh, everyone's trying to get ahead uh, in, in a really chaotic time period. And also, uh, I think there's there's uh, not enough representation for the, the sort of early modern period or the Renaissance period. And so I would like to see more stuff about, for instance, the English Civil War, or the Thirty Years' War. I'm surprised there hasn't been a Thirty Years' War movie because that was one of the most destructive and horrible events in European history. Uh, it's been kind of forgotten about, but it was like, you know, as bad or worse than World War II for Germany. Well, it doesn't involve the funny mustache man, so they're not going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but just uh, like I really, I, I saw a movie recently called uh, Cromwell, which is about Oliver Cromwell starring Richard Harris and uh, Alec Guinness as the king. And... Uh, despite some kind of anachronistic stuff that I didn't like and the fact that they, they kind of changed a lot of the history to make Cromwell more important than he was, uh, I thought I thought it was a great film uh, because of, of a lot of the ideas that it raised. Like, uh, they, Parliament, for, for instance, brings the king to trial and the king is sitting there in his trial saying, by what authority do you bring me here and they didn't really have an answer to his question uh and 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 just seeing how these these very what we take for granted uh elements of our our culture today how at one point they were a completely radical revision uh of of anything that people had thought and, and seeing seeing how that ground was broken is a great uh kind of way to, to to make a movie about history really interesting and i would like to see more movies tackle those those big groundbreaking moments where they're breaking with tradition and trying to figure out how to do that i'd like to see one on ulysses s grant yeah what what, what do you want to see about what do you want to see him for you know, he's considered like this useless president. But, like, his problem wasn't that he was useless. His problem was that he didn't understand math and that he wasn't good with understanding deals. He was a great general. But outside of that, he was kind of shitty at everything else. That's then, interesting. Yeah, there's really good, very short biography about him by uh, Michael Corda that I would recommend. Yeah, one president that did pique my interest because of uh, a podcast where they talked about him called Totalis Rankium uh, was the one who came after Grant uh, Rutherford B. Hayes. And what what fascinated me about the portrayal of him in that podcast was they read so much of his diary and his diary reveals him to be this extremely schmaltzy, sweet, like sickeningly sweet, friendly person. And it's hilarious to read. And when you then match that up with the events of his life, it does form a kind of consistent picture of this guy who is just extremely friendly and nice to everyone. And yet he's, he's really more remembered for the controversies surrounding him and for being unpopular and for being uh, an electoral college win and only getting one term. But like one of the biggest controversies around Hayes was the fact that 
he wasn't that he vetoed the anti-Chinese immigration bill that Congress was trying to pass. That that made him very unpopular. Uh, but in hindsight today, that actually makes him look pretty good. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard about that, honestly. I, I didn't know anything about Hayes until just now. Yeah, it's, just, it's it, there's so many little stories like that in history that people can pull from. And I just wish that uh, people had more inspiration to, to look for those kinds of stories. I'd love I'd, I'd love for a series on Aleister Crowley. Oh that, yeah, that would be interesting. that would be amazing because that that is a really cool story. I mean, Richard Kaczynski did a good book, no relation to the Unabomber, sadly, but very very interesting book. Maybe a Ted Kaczynski. I uh, I always pronounce it Crowley rather than Crowley. It was pretty cruel. <laughs> Cruelly. He, he was quite cruel at times. He did torture cats as a child, so... Oh, he was one of those kids. He, he, he was the quiet kid. Yeah, the, the, the quiet kid. Gotcha. Yes. No, but it's, like, so interesting. He was such a sheltered child. And then as soon as as soon as he was able to, he just went absolutely nuts with everything. <laughs> yeah. And here we have the Beatles. He, he was he was the beast. Who else would be interesting like that? Well, I, I find Gerald Gardner an interesting story. I'm interested in uh, neo paganism in general, and. Uh, Gerald Gardner, of course, founded the religion of Wicca. And there's kind of a big mystery around Gardner about where he got Wicca from because he claimed that he was initiated into this uh, secret society of witches. But there's no evidence that that secret society ever existed. And so whether he was or wasn't is a question. And if it did exist how much of wicca did he pull from them as he claimed and how much did he just make up on his own uh, is uncertain um and so i'm not really sure how you would do a movie about him at that point but uh he he is an interesting figure for that for that mystery element Might as well do Jack Parsons then, because he was an occultist and he worked for NASA. So. Well, that sounds interesting. Yeah, he he did the jet propulsion, I think, for them. It, I don't know. It's it's really interesting. I think the channel Dot Darling on YouTube goes over him pretty well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Wicca is, is a weird case of, like, a whole, a whole kind of dogma that was just sort of created out of nothing, and, you know, I don't think it has any roots in any genuine pagan tradition, but it, it, it became its own religion with its established, uh, premises, and a lot of people started adhering to it. But uh, it, it's interesting because most, most neo-paganism is just kind of this sort of vague, amorphous cafeteria religion. But then there's Wicca in the midst of it as just like kind of a fully developed deal. And it just kind of came out of nowhere in the 1940s. Yeah, I would like to see more about sort of more occultic figures. Yeah, I mean they don't they don't get a whole lot of representation. Which, which sucks because they're so influential. You can point directly to Crowley to do pioneering the hippie movement. 
then you can point to that creating David Bowie, which created mechanical animals. Yeah. Um, speaking of the hippies, I've been thinking lately about just how important LSD is for the history of humanity. And I think that it's possible that LSD is far more significant than most people realize. I think it might have been really the thing that made the 60s into the 60s. And I don't know if it the 60s would have happened that way without it. Go on. I like where this is going. Yeah. Well, LSD, because uh, um, it, it, it really uh, gave people a new perspective, which I think people were, were kind of craving during the 1950s because things had gotten so boring in the post-war period. And LSD, I think, directly led to a lot of the shattering of the old worldview of this is just how things are, because it showed people that there was a whole hidden uh, aspect of existence that they hadn't even explored yet. And there was, there was, there were things that you could experience, but you couldn't even communicate profound things, emotions that you never knew existed, colors that you never knew existed. And I, w I wish that my experience with psychedelics was anywhere as profound as any of that. But for a lot of people, that it was extremely profound. And I, I think that directly led to a lot of, you know, if, to people opening themselves up to spirituality uh, that that was not uh, directly uh, in in the Christian tradition, uh, opening themselves up to more Oriental spirituality. And then that influenced people's thoughts around uh, peace and around, um, you know, skepticism of the establishment. And... Uh, you know, at that time, you know, people stopped dressing in suits. And it, I, I've noticed that when I was uh, a little kid, I think, there used to be more old people who were from the, the pre-LSD era who kind of dressed and carried themselves like, like old people. But I've noticed now that pretty much every old person was a young man in the 60s uh, or after. And... It's it's interesting the change that we see because they're they're talking like me, they're dressing like me, they're kind of acting like me. Like old people aren't really all that different from young people anymore, like they used to be. Uh, and I think it's because we're bridging the great gap that was created by the '60s, which which I think is the most uh, influential decade in human history. And I think a lot of that is down to LSD. So what you're saying is. Everyone should do LSD. I'm not sure that everyone should do it. Because uh, I don't think everyone needs to do it. I, But I think, I think people should do it if they're curious about it. No, no, it might be interesting if someone starts slipping in into the water supply. Yeah, I don't know if I would like that. Because... Uh, <laughs> I I uh, I did not I did not enjoy my my own psychedelic experience. I can't say anything on the subject. So So I mean without So All right, here here's a question. What what do you think the what what is the best piece of media on the internet? Um, I think it might be Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. 
Uh, are you familiar with that? I'm, I'm familiar. Yeah. Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared is singular in just how how it crafted um, itself around around its messaging in a way that was subtle and layered and extremely detailed and interpretive. And so it, it's it's a lot like Marilyn Manson's work in that way. And I have struggled to make a video about Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. And I have perhaps seven times attempted to make a video about the subject and failed every single time to get it off the ground just because it's so difficult to even really put into words what makes that show great. Maybe you need to do LSD and watch it. Yeah, maybe I need to do LSD. I don't know. I've 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 been really high and watched it many times. Have you been high and watched 2001: A Space Odyssey? I'm not sure. Uh, it sounds like something I would have done, but I can't remember. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it is one of those like slow movies are pretty good to watch when you're high like uh that movie uh mandy i watched that when i was extremely stoned and it was so cool and actually i watched that around the same time we are chaos came out and uh so i was i was listening to we are chaos while extremely high and watching mandy while extremely high and those two things kind of kind of uh melded themselves in my mind so i kind of associate them with each other it is the only way i'm able to watch begotten so oh i i wouldn't watch that no matter what state of mind i'm in someone someone edited antichrist superstar over it which makes it a bit more tolerable i mean it wouldn't work anyway just because like it doesn't match with Antichrist Superstar at all. It doesn't, but it gives it a bit more of a watchable vibe. Yeah. I mean, when when we're talking about begotten watchability itself, I mean that's a that's a real literal problem because like it's hard to even see what's going on on the screen. Yeah. And that's why Antichrist Superstar when put over it, it kinda helps. Yeah, I mean, I thought it yielded some good results in the music video for Crypt Orchid, but uh, that's about the only thing I like about it. I, I can challenge some people to watch it to see if they will. So far, no one's gotten through it. Anyone who watches it full, I will, I, I will give them a hundred dollars. Yeah, it's very, very boring. I've never seen it all the way through. Well, We Are Chaos would kind of go... I don't know, I'm trying to think of something. <laughs> and do this at the same time. Well, may maybe, that's, maybe that's it. Maybe it is. Mm. Well... Good two hours yeah it was about two hours i think uh we covered some interesting ground so uh yeah unless you have uh anything else to say we can sign off yeah i'm, I'm gonna stop the recording now all right well uh all right, that's going to be a bitch to edit. We'll uh, talk again sometime. Yeah, I hope so. We usually have people on multiple times. All right, see you later. All right, see ya.